often facing many CEOs or CIOs making the decision between upgrading your current ERP or migrating to a completely new ERP. My name is Roisin McLean and I'll be your moderator for today. We'll be starting very shortly, but just a reminder to everyone that if you have a question, simply type it into the chat box at any time during the presentation and we'll get back to you during our Q&A session at the end. Your questions will remain private from the audience. Today, we're very excited to have John Hobler, who leads the technology solutions practice for cross-country consulting, discuss the major questions facing firms when making the key decision on whether PeopleSoft is still the solution to meet their needs. I'll hand you over to him. Thank you very much, Rasheen. Again, uh, my name is John Hobler, and I work with cross-country consulting. And a little background on myself, I've been implementing finance and accounting systems for a little over 20 years right now. And I've seen the change and evolution over time um, during those 20 years from really kind of mainframe to client server to really now cloud-based products. And it's actually a pretty exciting time uh, in this space that there's a lot of great products coming up um, that are excellent choices for customers. Um, as Roisin said, uh, I've traditionally worked with a lot of PeopleSoft customers and done, done a lot a lot of different PeopleSoft upgrade projects. During that time, I found that people are now asking the question, is really the upgrade the next thing that we should do? And what we've done is we've taken that feedback we've gotten from clients and put together the following webinar because we realize a lot of people might be asking the same question. So during our presentation today, um, we are going to be covering four main questions. And as Roisin said, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. So please type your questions in and Roisin will get back to you, we'll get back to you at the end of the session. The first question we're going to cover is, what do we need to do and how is it different than what, I, what my team does today? And this is around the Oracle upgrade process and their new, new features, new functionality called selective adoption. So we're going to try to demystify that a little bit. If you're on PeopleSoft 9.1 or lower, what is Oracle saying you should do and what really does it mean to your organization? Question number two is going to help you determine what is the total cost of my upgrade. There's a lot of different components well beyond just the upgrade cost itself. And we're going to give you a total cost of ownership model and a checklist for help you to help you how to determine what the total cost of that decision would be. Third, we're going to cover what a modern financial system can do for me. We're going to talk about what the cloud is and what multi-tenancy cloud is and more importantly, what some other companies that are probably just like yours have done when they made the decision that they wanted to actually switch to these products, and how is it different than what you have today, and what benefits are they receiving? Fourth, we're going to help you ask the question, which, which a lot of people might have is, well, you know, I have PeopleSoft. Do I really want to switch? I think my team really likes what I have today. Um, and we've helped a lot of companies determine if that's a true statement or not. And uh, a famous statement of mine is that they may not like it, it's really the status quo that they know. They've accepted the system and the processes and the flaws and workaround as is, as new normal. And we're going to get offer you a way to kind of get some good information from your team on what they really think of the system and how it could be improved to make your company run better. So let's get started with key question number one. What do we need to do and how is it different than what my team does today? And again, this relates to what Oracle is saying you need to do with your 9Q upgrade and their new selective adoption methodology. So again, when Oracle released 9.2, shortly thereafter they came out with something called selective adoption. What that really means is 9.2 will be the last dot release of PeopleSoft. If you know PeopleSoft as long as I have, which started on version 4, you know there's a lot of versions between 4 and 9.2. But 9.2 will be the last release, and what they're going to do instead is this thing called selective adoption. And we're going to talk about what that is in a little more detail, but it will give you control to kind of pick what new features and functionality you want um, in many projects that you do over time. Um, it's an interesting concept, and we're going to demystify it a little bit. But to be able to get to selective adoption, you actually need to do three sets of things. First, you have to do a major project. Um, that's version upgrade to version 9.2. As we know, upgrades are complex and messy, and this would be another big project that you would need to do that would more than likely be really the number one uh, project for you for the course of the year or the following year. So if you're in finance or IT, 
and you support these systems, this would be it for that time frame. So the direction is get to 9.2 first. Um, once you're on 9.2 with selective adoption, they actually give you additional infrastructure, new tools, processes, and systems that you need to add to your ecosystem and infrastructure now to be able to use selective adoption. So unfortunately, what's actually happened is it's taken a fairly complex uh, set of servers and processes and tools and third-party software and added a bunch of new things to them. So your, your infrastructure is actually getting more complex with selective adoption, not less complex. And then thirdly, you actually will have to then plan and execute periodic update projects, like I said, to apply new software updates and new features versus doing that major upgrade project. And we're going to walk a little bit more, walk you through each one of those in a little more detail. Let's talk about upgrading to 9.2 first. Uh, as you know, <laughs> I mentioned earlier, upgrades are really complex. Um, a few years ago, I helped a customer through an upgrade project in the the Vice President of Finance, that was uh, her first time through a PeopleSoft upgrade. And uh, her comment to me after it was done, it was actually a pretty successful upgrade, all things considered. She said, I never want to do that again, <laughs> and there has to be a better way. Um, and the reason she said that is it, it's really complex. You require massive amounts of teams. Here's an example of a 9.2 organizational chart. There's like 30 different boxes on this chart of different people that you need with specialized skill sets Plus, you need to disrupt your business, all your back office functions, your management support, your steering committee. People need to be engaged on this project to make it successful. So just to get to 9.2, it's a major project that will come, uh, basically not only include IT, but also the vast majority of your business and your business partners. This is a big, complex project just so you can continue to post journal entries. It's also complex in terms of all the tools and technology. I know this picture is a little fuzzy, and we kind of left it that way on purpose. Because look at all those little boxes you need to do. And this is a common upgrade methodology if you've done an upgrade before. There's test moves one, test moves two, test moves three, compare reports, upgraded copies of a prod database. I mean, it's really messy and complex, again, because that was the infrastructure and technology built back in the late 80s and early 90s on how these people soft systems were there. And this seemed perfectly normal to most people during that time frame that if you wanted an enterprise level system, you had to do these types of projects with all this potential risk and all these different points of failure. We cleaned up the chart a little bit so it looked a little clearer, but I don't know if any looks any less complex. Here you can see it, another traditional upgrade plan, multiple phases, multiple team members going down the left hand side, and many, 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 many different boxes on that chart. So basically, it's again a major, major project lots of complexities, lots of points of failure, just to get stay current with the next release. And maybe add a new few new features that may or may not be beneficial to your organization. And realistically, probably not getting you any real ROI other than staying uh, current on the vendor's new release. So that's the bad news. You first have to do an upgrade, but it actually gets a little worse. Um, actually, one more org chart. Sorry, here's another example of an org chart we wanted to show you. Again, lots of different people involved, project managers, steering committee, all kinds of different team members. And we're going to get the cost a little bit. Unless you really staff up a really big team, a lot of these boxes on here are also probably outside contractors coming in to get you through this surge period, which is a very expensive proposition. So step two, you have to learn a lot of new technical stuff. So Oracle slash PeopleSoft is calling all these new things with selective adoption on the left-hand side. So there's a thing called an Oracle Virtual Box. There's another thing called a PeopleSoft Update Manager. There's an update image, uh, release patch set, proof of concept patches, and new features. And this, these are all the terms and terminology. Once you get to 9.2, that you're going to have to learn and start to deploy to maintain your application. Unfortunately, it's adding more complexity to it. And what it, all these things really mean are things you already know. So they are incremental versions of servers or change assistance, dot releases, bundles, fixes, emergency fixes, and new major features. So again, what they've really done is added some complexity. In reality, it's very similar to what you actually do today. So to back up slightly, the PeopleSoft update image, what Oracle will do, will release a new image, which will have bundles, fixes, and patches. You'll need to take those and selectively adopt which ones you want and run them through your environment. 
that sounds great, but the simple reality is uh, it's a little better than what they used to do with uh, bundles and patches and fixes and maintenance packs, but you still have to go through that pain of making sure that that fix does not impact anything that you already have done, whether it's a process, a customization, a report, or interface. So it does put a tremendous amount of burden on you all to basically make sure that your system still works just because you want to update to a new teacher. So those periodic update projects, the way they work is Oracle release that new uh, PRP or image. And that is their responsibility in the update project. You still need to do a lot of the same steps that look pretty much like the 9.2 upgrade. You need to have different roles, as you can see on the bottom, the project manager, the steering committee, an upgrade administrator, a business analyst, developers, and end users. And they need to do a lot of different things. PMs need to create the project plan and manage the project throughout because it is a project. It's not an update, it's actually a project. The steering committee needs to be formed to provide executive oversight to make sure resources are aligned and make key decisions on what's going to, on issues that can't be resolved. You're going to need an version of an upgrade administrator just like you have on your 9.2 upgrade to go get that image, put it on the virtual box, create your PUM, and use uh, change assistance to apply your changes to the dev, migrate to test, migrate to production. So it's sounding very much like the ad upgrade with test move one, test move two, test move three that a lot of us have been through. So it's slightly different terminology, but it's a very similar process. Your business analysts are going to have to be involved throughout. Um, just like before, you're going to be reviewing release notes, determining what's different, determining impact processes, configuring the new features, doing a lot of regression testing, determine how the new features impact your new system. Developers are going to be involved, of course. They need to retrofit the customization to the change package. So once you pick what you want from it, you're going to have to actually have the developers go in and do what they normally do, and also determine the impact of customizations to make that move forward. And of course, they're going to have to unit test. And of course, you're going to have to have your end users involved, just like in an upgrade, to perform a user acceptance testing. The simple reality is this is a lot of work just to get some updates. And what we surmise is that what we see most organizations doing is they will have a very difficult time developing enough positive ROI to justify these projects. Just like today, I'm assuming many of you are like most PeopleSoft customers, you probably don't apply bundles and fixes all that often because you're worried about what might break. Instead, you selectively kind of have a developer fix the customization or the, the bug for you, and then you have your own bug fix kind of working. Uh, that seems to be a very common path, and our expectation is that you'll have probably a very common path here as well, which you will not choose to actually do this process. You will stay put, which means that you will be on 9.2 as is, and you will be relatively stagnant. So what is the end result of all of this? Four main things. One, the PeopleSoft community will actually become more fractured. It's already pretty fast fractured, right? So you have your <laughs> what version you're on, what modules you have, what people tools release you're on, um, what servers you're running on, what database you're running on, what database version you're running on, what third-party tools you have. The simple reality is there are no two identical PeopleSoft customers. Everybody's a little bit different, which really makes it hard when you call in the support or you want to talk to another customer about how they're leveraging PeopleSoft to see if you can learn more you're really going to be out of luck because everybody's a little bit different. Two, it's going to put the burden and cost of updating your application solely on you. You remember from the last slide, the vendor had that one part of the process. You had everything else. So then you're going to have to determine when you do it, how you do it, take that cost on, take the risk on, and actually get the project done. Not too similar than an upgrade project. Just similar, excuse me. Uh, less innovation, here's a question. We're not actually going to pull you, but I kind of alluded it to you earlier. Based on my experiences, there's very few companies that actually had a regular process to apply maintenance packs and bundles and fixes. Most people I imagine on the phone here would probably raise their hand on the no box that says we don't do that. So here's my question. If you don't do that now, would you actually do that with selective adoption for new teachers? Probably not because the ROI is not there and it's just too risky. It's very hard to convince your CFO, your Vice President of Finance, your CIO that this is a wise use of company resources. Because it is risky, and you will be taking on more risk. 
So if you do the project, it's risky. If you don't do the project, you are going to be frozen in time. You will not be able to adopt to new technology, new regulatory compliance, new operational efficiencies very easily. Think about your PeopleSoft environment five, six years ago. Think about all the things that have changed, especially the biggest one, obviously, mobile and iPhone or Android apps and how that's impacted. What is it going to be five years from now, if you go to 9.2, that everybody's going to be using and talking about how it makes their life easier, that you will not be able to really effectively adopt unless you take on all this cost and risk. And finally, I find it interesting, if you go to Oracle's homepage, they actually have one of those banner pages that kind of flips by and has five or six different things in them. I think it has six uh, as of last week. Five of the six talk about their cloud products and adoption. So Oracle SaaS delivers. Take a tour of the Oracle Sales Cloud. The first database designed for the cloud. And a platform success that talks about HCM in the cloud and financials in the cloud. It seems like Oracle is definitely pushing cloud as well. So my question to you is, if this is where they see the future, is really going to 9.2 and enduring a selective adoption the right answer for you? So you might say, well, that scared me. Uh, what's really next? Well, let's say that that's true, but, you know, it's a status quo we know. We're not ready to migrate. The second factor you really need to consider beyond what I just told you where it's it's a pretty extensive proposition is, what is the total cost of my upgrade? The reality is if you decide to upgrade, the visible cost, which most people see is the upgrade project, roughly 15% of that cost. The rest of the cost is in five or six other categories that you should really determine as you make your business case on should we upgrade or should we look for a new solution. So the first category of costs that you need to consider are operational support costs. So these are all the day-to-day -day costs associated with just keeping your ERP application up to date so you can pay vendors and post journal entries. Think about that. So how many people in your organization have a title of PeopleSoft Administrator, PeopleSoft Subject Matter Expert, PeopleSoft Developer, Oracle DBA? All those people are needed to kind of keep their application up and running. Wouldn't it be better if you could deploy those people in a more value-added approach where they're doing other things that are improving the business, just not keeping the application going. That's a tremendous amount of cost that can be reallocated to more strategic initiatives. Second category you need to consider is maintenance and support. And it's not just Oracle's fees, of course. You have that which is the vendor fees. You have hardware support, database support, operating system support, other third-party products that you might have integrated in the system also charging you a fee. You need to make sure you categorize each one of those and understand the support costs. And here's the trick. If you're actually a growing company, either organically or through mergers and acquisitions, you certainly know that each of these vendors does a periodic review of your business to determine if those fees should actually go up based on how successful you're doing. So even though you might look back at these numbers, they might not be static. And you might need to go back and look at your contract and go, hey, I know that we're planning to grow 15% or potentially acquiring these companies where we expect our, bottom, our top line to grow by 20%. You need to factor those in to these costs because those vendors will come back around and bump up your costs and ask for retroactive costs back from the time of the transaction. Project costs. So earlier we talked about the update projects you need to do. Uh, my assumption was you probably will choose not to do them because they're too expensive. But if you do, you actually need to kind of a plan for them and budget them out. And as I showed you previously, it's not a click of a button. It's a pretty complex process that you will need to plan and budget to make sure that you keep your system up to date, not only with new features, but the patches and the fixes, or have an alternative strategy just to do that on your own. The fourth thing is status quo opportunity cost. Now this one is a little more nebulous, but it can definitely, you can identify, definitely identify those pain points. So think about your existing processes. You might have swim lanes or process flows that describe the way things are. And when your boss or your boss's boss asks you for something new, they might come back and say, why can't I do that? And you go, well, that's just the way the system works. Or maybe there's someone in finance and accounting whose sole job is to keep a master spreadsheet where all these different data sources come in 
so they can produce an operational report. And they might say, well, why is that the place? And you might come back and say, because in PeopleSoft, we have these sub-ledgers and ledgers, and only when I run these processes to move the data in the GL and journal generate, do I get a true view of my financial uh, status at any given time. And if they say, well, why? And you say, well, that's just the way it is in PeopleSoft. The answer probably is they have to hire someone that kind of sits there and job is to pull together the process financial results, press the pending transactions that are sitting in all those sub-ledgers. So if you think about your business process, I'm sure you could identify two or three things that just because that's the way PeopleSoft is engineered, it creates a something for you that is a cost that you could probably include in the model. Lastly is infrastructure. These include implementation, support, and maintenance of the entire technology stack. So this is a, this is a really big number. So it could be, think about the databases, the servers, uh, the network, all the third-party things, but also think beyond that. Think about the data center. Think about security. Think about a business continuity plan. Think about your backup data center. Pick up, think about disaster recovery. When you start to think about all the extra things that you need to do to keep this application running because you own the infrastructure in-house or you're, even if you're paying someone to do it as a managed service, um, that is a big number because you need to adjust for all that because that's all part of your team. Um, and what your plan is. So all those factors of cost come into play. So what you really need to do is develop this total cost of upgrade model, very similar to a total cost of, upgrade, uh, total cost of ownership model. An example is on the right with various cost descriptions by categories that I just went through down the left-hand side. And you should do a multi-year model. So this should be at a minimum a three-year look out and I would actually recommend you do it for five years. Here's some keys to a good TCO model. Research all the cost elements of looking at the cost over the past three years. So you, all the things in here are actually fairly achievable and fairly easy to quantify that you can do based on some projections over the last few years. So what did it cost? What was Oracle charging? What was those other third-party vendors charging? How many people did we have? Um, in-house whose main job was PeopleSoft. How many uh, contractors do we have to do? And that's a real cost. All these things are very identifiable and able to layer into this total cost of ownership model. You should also, as I mentioned, include internal labor. That's a key thing. Because there's a lot of people that kind of are there to keep PeopleSoft up and running. And that's a stat, that's to keep the lights on thing versus more strategic things that the business would want to do. So you need to include that internal labor as well. You need, as I mentioned earlier, estimate the cost over a multi-year period. Understand what are one-time costs, like the upgrade versus the recurring costs. Uh, and this is an important one, account for inflation or increased fees due to growth raises and turnover. So consultant fees potentially could go up. The cost of labor could certainly go up. Um, and then those vendor fees could go up if you're growing as a company. They'll come for, they have a revenue collection unit. They'll come back, look at your numbers and expect that there's growth there. I'm sure um, any CEO, he or she would not say, I hope it would be that we were the exact same revenue we are this year, five years from now. They certainly have a strategic objective in mind, and you should build that into your plan. So putting it all together, and this was a quick example that we did for one client, and we, uh, we uh, the upgrade project you see up there represented 1.5 million. But taking a holistic view of everything across all these different elements of cost showed that upgrading over just a three-year period was actually a $12 million proposition. This is what you need to do as you think about one is selective adoption even right for me, and if I do upgrade to 9.2, what is the cost of that in total across all these different things? So when you take that back to the CFO, the CIO, the CEO, and you're putting together your business plan, you have justified your decision on whether to stay with PeopleSoft or potentially look for a new solution. So let's move to that third question is, what can a modern financial system do for me? What we've already covered is what does selective adoption do? We realize going to 9.2 is a pricey uh, uh, decision over a multi-year period. So John, are there things in place that improve this, make it simpler, and what other companies doing to kind of benefit from a multi-tenant cloud solution? So that's the first thing we want to talk about. We want to say, don't be fooled. So 
in this analogy, the rock is what you have today, which is PeopleSoft, which you have to buy all the technology associated with PeopleSoft from database to application to get it running, and it's either in-house or in a data center somewhere, and it is yours. It is your version of PeopleSoft, as we talked about earlier. There's no two PeopleSoft customers that are exactly alike. The rock in the middle is the rock with the cloud painted on it. That is an interesting thing. What has happened is that cloud has really become a viable option for financial management and human capital management over the past five to ten years. Other vendors that didn't build their product with cloud at the beginning, and multi-tenancy cloud, which I'll explain in a minute, what they then do is saying, oh, we have a cloud as well. Don't be fooled by that. That's what's called single tenant cloud. So what they're doing is they're picking up their hardware, software, and database, they're putting it in a data center that they're managing for you, and it looks like the cloud as you're at, uh, accessing it through the internet. Uh, and that's it. So you don't see the hardware and software, but it's still there, and it's still single tenant, so it's still your stack of technology. And what's true multi-tenant cloud is everybody kind of in the same environment um, with one technology stack, one version of the software, true multi-tenancy cloud. And we're going to go through some benefits of that in a moment, but don't be fooled by all those vendors that say they have a cloud product. You should ask them, is it single-tenant cloud? If it is, you know what you're getting into, and you really should be looking at multi-tenant cloud options. So a common question we get with multi-tenant cloud is, how do upgrades work? So I thought this would be an interesting comparison of, let's show what all these things are in PeopleSoft versus a multi-tenant cloud solution. So we're going to start at the bottom of the list. Frequency. PeopleSoft comes, it's about every four to five years is what has been traditionally a, a dot release of PeopleSoft. Um, so you get one upgrade during that time frame. In multi-tenant cloud solutions, and all the vendors are a little bit different, but most of them do probably between two and four updates every year with lots of features and functionality in them. They're not small updates. The time to implement Remember back to that upgrade 9.2 project, the org chart, the, uh, the flow diagram, the project plan. Those are a minimum 6 to 12 month project. With multi-tenant cloud, it's an overnight vendor upgrade that's preceded by, you know, two to four days to kind of take a look at the new release and uh, test it out ahead of time. That's a massive difference and a massive cost savings. Then imagine what those people can do instead of being involved in an upgrade project, what can they do operationally, strategically to make your business better? Risk. PeopleSoft is a very risky upgrade project as we talked about. Multi-tenant cloud, those vendors take all the heavy lifting for you, which really lowers your risk. And they're doing it for everybody pretty much at the same time. Um, so they're really kind of doing uh, mass upgrades for everyone once. So it greatly reduces the risk. Client resources needed. Uh, if you look, think back about seven slides ago or eight slides ago, there were nine different types of client resources needed. Steering committee, end users, business analysts, developers, upgrade administrators, DBAs, etc. Multi-tenant cloud updates tend to be about two types. Uh, the business analyst, project manager, and that's about it. So it's a pretty straightforward process. The project type. Uh, I talked earlier about that, that upgrade we did in the new VP of Finance. You know, she said that, that quote, she also said, this is the most important thing we're doing this year, and I don't think I'm getting any benefit out of it. Um, so that's the project type that you have. A lot of risk, a lot of cost with PeopleSoft, not a lot of benefit. In multi-tenant cloud solutions, this is also an exact quote. I was out in Chicago with one of our customers implementing a large multi-client cloud solution. I asked him, how was the upgrade project process or update process with his product? And quite frankly, he was, he's, a, he's a PeopleSoft veteran. He said he was completely ho-hum, <laughs> um, which I found interesting. He said it was a non-event. He's like, we brought, you know, a month before, as I said, got together with some people in a conference room, reviewed the release notes, picked the five or six new things or 10 or 12 new things we want to implement. Um, then we came back and we tested when we had the preview version. So what happens is the, the vendor will provide you a preview version. Uh, with your data about four to six months, or excuse me, four to six weeks before the upgrade. Um, so you test all that out, you feel good about it, figure out any changes you need to make, procedures and documentation, and then you get a notice and they say, Friday night at midnight, we're going to start the upgrade, upgrade process. 
Within a couple hours, you can have an email say it's all done. And now you can start using that new functionality. Dramatically different way to deliver new functionality. Cost, as you imagine, very high, very low. Number of releases since 2006, so three in PeopleSoft. Um, I'm actually using one from Workday, which is a large multi-tenant financial management and human capital management, as an example. They've done 24 releases in that same, same time frame. And uh, sticking with the Workday theme, uh, the benefits and project goals, PeopleSoft side is typically the staying current with the new with the vendor, the new release. Very little ROI typically. Um, and I would just challenge you to Google new features in Workday 24 after the webinar and see all the new stuff that Workday is putting into the environment. Not only new functionality, but also adapting to what's happening in the market. There's concepts you can Google, like things called predictive analytics, and other things that are out there that are, are kind of thinking about how can we use financial management data and human capital management data in new ways. The multi-tenant cloud is better in every one of these categories. And here's a great quote. Uh, this gentleman is from McKee. He spent zero dollars on his updates and he gave some other statistics there. But even if you get no benefits other than this out of it, he's saying there's your ROI. <laughs> if everything else stays status quo, you have your ROI right here. Fortunately, that is not the total component of ROI. There's many others. So a common question we also get in the people software world is what version are you on? And that's a really interesting question because it's loaded. As I alluded to earlier, there's all these different versions related with your implementation of PeopleSoft. With multi-tenant cloud, there is only one version. And that's a big difference in the single-tenant cloud, which again is just uh, a delivered software hosted with some cloudy-like features, but not true cloud. Everybody that's on a Workday or a Salesforce, for example, is on the same version. Many, many benefits of um, uh, multi-tenant cloud and only on one version. You get a lot of vendor focus. So they only are worried about the current release in terms of support. They don't have to worry about all their different customers and all the different versions of releases they have running on all the different types of infrastructure. This is a, a great benefit and one that's really hidden in my mind is you get fixes for bugs before you even knew the bug existed. So in addition to the two to four updates a year, they also put out bug pack fixes. So someone in, you know, Los Angeles finds some bug in some weird little scenario you probably never have for another year. They report the bug, the vendor fixes it, and all of a sudden, by the time you go to use it, it's fixed. You didn't have to do anything else. So they find it and fix it before you even knew it was there. Um, these releases are rich releases. Google, definitely what I told you before, you'll be amazed at all the new functionality that's out there. Many releases, I said, two to four a year. They're really able to act to industry, market, and technology advancements much quicker. They have a roadmap, but if new things come up, they can start to look to that and push in that direction. And if, what that means to you is a continuous opportunity to leverage these new things and improve your operations. So multiple times a year, you're going to get a whole new set of toys to consider implementing in your organization to make something a lot better or a little bit better. But that's continuous improvement, and that's an extremely powerful thing for many finance and accounting organizations. So how much time, energy, and focus does the CFO have um, to spend all this on? So could you imagine if you didn't have to do all these things, what could you accomplish and what could go away? So I'm going to give you a couple examples here. Redstone Federal Credit Union, because they went to a multi-tenant cloud solution, they did not have to do any of these things that I talked about earlier. IT infrastructure, upgrade projects, patches and fixes, keeping the lights on running staff, they were able to see a 74% reduction in IT finance related costs and a 75% reduction in time to develop a report. TripAdvisor, they saw a 50% reduction in their total cost of ownership. AAA saw a similar 50% reduction in their IT costs. And my build there did not work, I apologize for that, but the healthcare company saw a 13% reduction in system support costs. So because these organizations implemented multi-tenant cloud, they didn't have to do these things, and because of that, they saw tremendous cost savings in terms of just keeping the business running, and we're able to deploy that in different ways, and we're going to talk about that as well in a minute. 
insights from modern architecture. So in the old model, this is kind of what PeopleSoft looked like. This made a lot of sense back in 1993 when I started working on PeopleSoft. You would have different product lines. Each of those product lines would have sub-ledgers. So looking at that middle area, PeopleSoft uh, financial management, you had GL, but then you had all these sub-ledgers. You held the data in the sub-ledgers. It passed up. And then there was a whole separate application for HR, a whole separate budget and planning one, and then they put this thing called PeopleSoft EPM on the top that would pull all the data together. That is a very challenging infrastructure in a lot of ways. You have disparate data all over the place. So what is the, you know, when, you, when I gave the example earlier, that you might have to hire an FTE to kind of pull this intra-month report together. Because there's data sitting in the GL, but there's data potentially sitting in all these different subsystems, plus don't even consider going over to PeopleSoft HCM and payroll, that you need to get a, a total view of your organization. Data's in many locations, many systems, many subledgers. There's many versions of the truth. It's really hard to get one version of the truth in this model, because you have to make sure all the data's in process, all the data's been passed up to its main module, all the data's been passed over to your data warehouse or EPM, and then it's only the ver uh, that version of moment of truth or that one single version of truth for a millisecond because then transactions are continually happening in all these subledgers that make that roll off completely irrelevant because new things are happening. So it's only a point in time moment of truth, not a real time moment of truth. You're dependent on these batch processes that are kind of ugly, limited real time insights, and as I said before, obviously, this is expensive to maintain. So what does the new model mean to you? A lot of these vendors are coming out with integrated solutions, all one application, everything together, financial management, human capital management, budgeting and planning. Imagine what you could do with that. No subsystems, no subledgers, no batch processes need to run to be able to get, run a financial report or to worse justify that, hey, here's the report, but there's probably a lot of data not there yet. What good is that report? The data is all integrated for you. You don't have to build all those integration points between all those environments. I did an upgrade for one company going. They actually did go to uh, 9.2, and they had every PeopleSoft application available, and the amount of interfaces they need to build between them just to keep it up and running was staggering. And there was a tremendous amount of work to upgrade those as well as to make sure they keep up to date and in sync. Here you can have company-wide insights across all these different things, and it's instantaneous. And those results are staggering. Red said Federal Credit Union, they moved from a gather, but you said they estimated before that they spent 70% of their time gathering data, only 30% of their time analyzing data. They switched after going to a multi-tenant cloud solution to 30% gather, 70% analyze. That's a tremendous change for them and tremendous benefit. And really, what it came down to is that whole model of the infrastructure we showed before went away. All the data was available as soon as it was posted across the enterprise if you had access to it. So incredibly powerful. Here's a great quote from uh, Wayne from Redstone. Being on one unified system is our huge for our business. It allows us to move from a transactional to a strategic focus, improving visibil visibility, simplifying and accessing the more effective reports and driving a needed shift in company culture. Think about that. If people could have access to information to make informed decisions, real time, knowing it's accurate and one version of the truth, what is that worth? And how does that add to the ROI that the other gentleman already said was already achieved with just the updates? Here's a question for you. If any of these things happen in your organization, what would it mean to your PeopleSoft instance? You wanted to report on a new financial data element across all the subledgers. You expanded a new country or region. You acquired a company. You did a massive reorganization. What would it cost? How much time would it take? Is it even feasible? How risky is it? How many resources are needed? And if I do this just because my company grew, what is the opportunity cost for me of doing something else? Another company I worked for, they were very acquisitive, and they spent millions of dollars every time they bought a new company just to integrate them into their platform because all the changes that it took to make that happen. So there was a cost element with the acquisition just because they were on this old antiquated system that required all these different moving parts to be in place. 
So your system is a little disobedient as it goes through. Even though it can do it, it's not going to do it very easily, and it's probably going to kick you throughout the process. So modern financial systems are much more adaptable. They have almost unlimited dimensions. They allow multiple rich hierarchies. Um, the accounts are there. Then they have cascading business rules. So what's great about the new modern system, they've really kind of looked at how organizations do business today and account for that things are going to change. So it's e very easy to configure business rules when you do that acquisition or when you do a merger to recast your financials and move you going forward to a new mode of operation because some strategic decision up high in your company. Much more, much more flexibility, much more adaptable. Two quick quotes, and this, these are ones also examples from Workday. Workday has helped us evolve from just reporting numbers to be able to analyze the numbers and provide value back to the business. So then worrying about the PeopleSoft tree, um, they're now basically be able to configure that quickly and be able to analyze the results of the business event that happened. Another one from Amber Trent, Workday Financial Management has provided the tools our teams need to be able to prepare and later scale for anticipated growth in 2015 and beyond. So this basically is enabling them for growth. Instead of, as that growth comes, you probably have to say, what does that mean to PeopleSoft versus being an enabler to that growth moving forward. It completely changes the focus of those things, and you're focusing on what your business can do and your systems are just following along versus your systems dragging you down on what your company goals are. Efficiency. I'll give you a minute to take a look at some of these stats. These are some excellent stats from companies that have implemented financial management systems. They take an invoicing sound from five days down to one hour. Think about that for a second. That's tremendous ROI. The close cycle is reduced dramatically, better information, better reporting, plus you're getting your invoices out to your customers five days faster. That is a very real, tangible, measurable metric, which is excellent. Cost of finance as a percentage of revenue, down 38%. Bank accounts reconciled daily. These modern things can do things that previously you need to have big files coming in and all these subsystems and processes running. One company does up to 220 daily. Time to create monthly reports. TripAdvisor says it's about three times faster than the old model. And that's because the reports, the configuration, it's very configuration-based. Business analysts do that. Super users do that. You don't need to put in an IT change request to make that happen. They put the power in the hands of the users and the business analysts, which allow them to develop these things quicker, faster, without worrying about competing priorities, priorities in IT. And speaking for someone that spent most of his life in IT, that's great because there's a lot of other things that I need to do um, that add value if you can build your own reports. This is one of my favorite ones, reduction in GL accounts. If you look at your chart, you probably have a lot of accounts because you're struck by that code block or chart field structure in PeopleSoft. Here's some examples of what these companies have done as they've reduced their number of accounts. It's staggering in many cases. And the reason they can do that is they don't think the same way as the code block or the chart structure. There's much more fl flexibility. For different vendors do it different ways but you can tag data based on all kinds of different things, and the user doesn't even know it's being tagged. So just because who I am or what project I'm working on or what the vendor is or what department this is for, all these other reporting elements can automatically be associated with the transaction and there for reporting. So you have to put some definite thought into how your financial data model is going forward because you're no longer going to be restricted by making sure someone keyed in the right department, project, cost center, and account on a transaction. Very powerful stuff. So implementation costs, people always kind of ask the contrarian question, well, isn't it going to cost some money to implement this new solution? And it certainly is, but that's a, that's a one-time cost. And it tends to be less than what you would think of a traditional like PeopleSoft implementation because a lot of IT, that infrastructure is in there, puts a lot of power in the hands of the business analysts. So there is some of that implementation cost on our iceberg. And then you remember the lower part of the iceberg the beauty of a multi-tenant cloud solution, a lot of those things just completely disappear. And the operational support folks, there's still some IT involvement for maybe some of the interfaces and some of the integrations, but all that stuff is moving in configuration, turns in the power of the end user, the super user, the business analyst, so it changes the model where they can be more responsive to their own needs. It's a dramatically different shift than what you have today with the PeopleSoft. 
So the fourth question, and this is, uh, we're coming up, we have about five minutes left, so we're going to open it up for questions. But I think my team likes the current system. And then if you make that statement, you might want to ask the follow-up question is, do they? And because we've been asked by across country this question many, many, many times, is how can I measure the effectiveness of my system? So we actually built a diagnostic. And for everybody attending the webinar, it's a completely complimentary thing. And we'll reach out to you after. Feel free to reach out to us. But we'd be glad to run it in your organization. And the way it works is pretty simple. You provide us a list of folks in accounting and finance or people that are stakeholders of accounting and finance and ask some really basic questions in an online survey. It takes about 20 minutes per person where they can evaluate the state of their finance system as well as each individual process. So overall, in order to cash, it tries to get their opinion on how effective is it, what's working well, what's not working well, and probably the most important part is why do you think that? And what you get if you do this survey is some really powerful data points back that either support what you think your team thinks about your system, or in react and also what also might happen is it might give you some really great new ideas on areas that are pain points that you might want to consider. And again, this is a complimentary tool across countries to develop, uh, and we'll certainly reach out. But if you're interested and you see value in it, we'll be glad to talk to you about how the process works. But what it does is, in real time, as people are filling out the survey, it creates this rich analytical dashboard where you have different processes and functions down the left-hand side based on the question sets, and you see different scores. So this particular company, they didn't like their record to report flow, so GL, budgeting, planning. A lot of people thought it was a challenge, very people thought it was a strength. That's an area that we need to dig into out of the report. But, however, if you take a look at the data quality, people are pretty happy about the data quality of their people saw system in this particular example. Lots of straight, lots of high points. So it'll allow you to start to map out your systems on a score and challenges and strengths that are very interesting. And the other things you can do with this is this data is summarized for all participants. You can actually slice and dice the data to see if people have different viewpoints of that. So maybe you'd want to say for the accounts payable people, what do they think? Are the people that are actually in finance and accounting? Instead, what, are the, what does our delivery team think? What does executive leadership think? And just because accounting and finance think something's working great, the organizations that use that function and use accounting and finance as their kind of customer or their, or their, their, their service provider, they might have a completely different uh, assessment of how that function is meeting their needs, even though they might not be an AP processor or a GL clerk, they might tell you a lot of different interesting things. So you can slice and dice the data by who, where they're located, seniority, region, really any kind of dimension you want as you go through this process. You also get a lot of really great data. As I mentioned, we ask them the rate, but I also say, why do you think that? And you get a lot of great feedback from people that, and we're always amazed. People always say, well, are people really going to type in something? And they almost always do. So you get great data points that support the ratings, but also you have a lot of people in your organization. They have a lot of good ideas. It gives a great way to bubble those up to kind of have short-term wins and also look for areas for longer-term initiatives where different solutions are needed. So your organization probably has a lot of great ideas. This is also an excellent channel to pull those out. So in conclusion, uh, what do we know about selective adoption in 9.2? It's complex, and the reality is it's probably very little benefit because you probably will not find the ROI to implement new features and functionality and take on that risk. What is the total cost of the upgrade? It's, the upgrade and maintenance will be expensive. Remember, think about a three- to five-year total cost of ownership model across all those different categories. What can a modern financial system do for me? It can do a lot. You saw those check marks. You saw those quotes. You saw those metrics. Because they've been completely re-engineered in the last decade versus something that you bought 30 years ago, they've rethought the model. And don't be fooled by single-tenant cloud, because that's a completely different thing than a multi-tenant cloud solution. And then finally, I think my current team likes it, do they? Um, it's really just a status quo they know. And our little survey tool, very easy to use, no cost, can help you figure that out. And finally, we can help you. We help companies with this all the time. If you are interested in uh, exploring that, we'd certainly love to talk to you. But we can guide you through talking to more people about what 9.2 is all about and how selective adoption works. We can help you build that total cost of upgrade model. We can help you assess the effectiveness of your current state. And very quickly, we can do all these things because we do it time and time again. And we also have a great knowledge of the market. 
and can share with you what our insights are, what some of our customers are, what they experience, and short list a vendor or two that you should really be looking at to go through the process. So again, my name is John Hobler. Uh, there's my picture uh, and some stats about me. I must admit that picture is probably three or four years old, as we all do in social media. But there's my contact information. There's my number. I know we sent you a bunch of emails from Martin and for our, our generic email. Reply back to any of those emails or reply to me, and uh, we'd be glad to get in touch with you and talk to you more about uh, everything covered here or any other questions you might have. So we're at about uh, 10 minutes to 2, which uh, we have about 10 minutes left. So, Roisin, if you're there, I don't know if there's any questions that the audience had as we were going through the slide deck. Thank you, John, for that great presentation. Um, yeah, from all of us here at Cross Country Consulting, we hope that everyone enjoyed the webinar. As John said, if you'd like any more information about anything you've heard today, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Our contact information will be provided in the materials that we send to your email in the next few days. We'll also be sending a recording of the webinar, which you can share within your organization. In the meantime, yes, we've received lots of great questions, so we'll use the few minutes remaining to open up the forum to Q&A. As a reminder to everyone on the line, simply type any of your questions into the chat box. So the first question we have is, how can I differentiate between the various cloud options, and what would the first step be in moving towards this type of solution? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's a lot of, a lot of different cloud vendors out there, and it, it's amazing that uh, <laughs> that almost overnight everybody had a cloud product. So I think the first thing you need to do is distinguish single tenant cloud versus multi tenant cloud. You really want a multi tenant cloud solution. That will actually narrow the list quite a bit. Then as you look at these solutions, you need to think about your industry and what functionality you're using. And do you want vendors that are more point solutions or ones that are you build unified solutions for you across multiple platforms and understand the benefits of those. There might be some industries that require a very unique solution set, but the vast majority for financial management and human capital management and budgeting and planning um, could probably benefit from a unified solution. So question number one is eliminate the single tenant, look for the multi-tenant, think about your business, apply it and create that short list. And um, based on your size and industry, um, it's a much smaller list than you think. And like I said, that's something we can help guide you through. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Um, next question. Are there additional security risks encountered when moving to the cloud versus, keep, versus keeping my on-premise PeopleSoft application? Yeah, that is a, that is a great question and, and one we get often. And uh, a few things that I always tell people is uh, raise your hand if your company uses Salesforce. Salesforce is an excellent multi-tenant cloud solution. It's been around for years. <laughs> uh, and people uh, pretty freely put very sensitive data in there, such as customers, um, opportunities, quotes, products, pricing. What could be more sensitive than that? That's extremely sensitive data. And they trust Salesforce is doing the right thing to support them. And the reason they do that is that's their business model. Their job is to not only provide great functionality to you, but to secure that data to ensure that nothing happens to it. So what they put into their data center, their security framework, their business continuity plan, their debt disaster recovery, their, uh, their resources and putting the application, keeping the application up to date is massive compared to what your company can do. So from a pure security perspective, that's there. But then on top of that, many of these vendors add additional security layers that you can choose to implement. Password security rules, data encryption, IP whitelist, so you can only log in from certain IP addresses, uh, SAML integration. So on top of everything they provide, there's other things you can add that can make sure everything's secure. Okay, Roshin? perfect. Yep, yep, yeah, yeah, thanks John. Um, another question, what kind of standardized reporting is there and how customizable is this? Also interested in the output format of these reports and how flexible that is. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So from my experience, a lot of these vendors are putting a tremendous amount of time in their reporting capabilities. From dashboards to traditional reports to data analytics, tremendous amount. So the tools continue to evolve, new features, new functionality comes in. But if you think about PeopleSoft, think about SQR, think about Crystal, think about all those things that you use to build those reports, there's very similar versions of those that allow you to do what those reporting tools did and more. So uh, very rich reporting capabilities, many, many different output formats, like I said, like dashboards, 
analytics, on-screen reports, PDF, something to Excel, XML, all available in many, many solutions. These vendors are slightly different, but that's a very good generalization. So I think as you start to explore these things, you'll find that there's a lot of rich recording options as you go down through. Great. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, is the finance diagnostic tool you explained free, and how would we get that? It is free. Um, all you need to do is reach out to me or uh, on this email that you see on the screen, which is jhobler at cross country-consulting.com or give me a call. Oops, someone's calling me now. That's probably